Nadine Doris has been culture secretary for just over two months, but it has already been filled with a fair amount of controversy. Last week, Doris prompted criticism when she appeared to tell the BBC's political editor what she should and shouldn't report. In a quickly deleted quote tweet of Laura Koonsberg, who had herself already shared a negative briefing about Boris Johnson, Nadine Doris said, Laura, I very much like and respect you, but we both know that text is ridiculous, although nowhere near as ridiculous as the person, obviously totally desperate for your attention, who sent it. That tweet got lots of people asking whether or not it was healthy for the culture secretary to tell the BBC what is and isn't ridiculous, what should and shouldn't be reported. I mean, she did delete it, which is relevant. I think probably she deleted it because her boss said, you know, we do like to do that to the BBC. We do like to pressure them to report some things and not others, but we don't normally do it in public. You shouldn't actually tweet it. You actually have their numbers. Um, you, you don't need to air your dirty laundry in public in, in such a way. Doris has also faced questions over her past conduct on Twitter. Since taking her role, she has been vocal about the need to get tough on social media trolls. That includes um, by pushing forward a bill on online harms. So she's saying we need to have tougher regulation on people who are abusive on social media. However, in her first grilling by the Culture Media and Sports Select Committee, which was this week, the Reese was asked about trolling in which she herself had partaken. But you tweeted LBC's James O'Brien, as we know, calling him a public school posh boy f -wit. And that would, that would fall into the category of abuse, would it not, under your own online safety legislation? Chairman, I'm, I'm not going to answer any of these questions. I find them quite personal in attack. If you'd like me... I, I, I would say just one thing. I, I, I did question John very closely on this. I think that the one relevant point about this is the fact that you are Secretary of State and should the online harms legislation come to pass in the way in which it is, seems it will come to pass, you will have enormous power at that point, and particularly on sign-off and secondary legislative power. I think if you search the number of times I've tweeted James O'Brien, I think you might find it's two. If you search the number of times James O'Brien has persistently tweeted me, to the point where we had at my office a number of years ago, probably about 18 months, two years ago, had to write to Global complaining that his behaviour was stepping into the realms of harassment. That was at the point which I sent that tweet. If you search James O'Brien's tweets of me... I have. I have searched that because at the, at the other committee... Including not the ones at that the other deleted. At the other committee, you, you said that you'd respond to abuse from him, and I have actually searched that. Um, and I can't find this abuse that you talk about, but I have found you asking for James O'Brien to get the sack. You also implied that he had mental health problems. You said, I don't think he's a well man. He needs uh, removing from his platform abuse. And you said, I've had to, separate tweet, you said, I've had to email his employer a number of times. Now, I don't think it's appropriate for, for you as a politician to be trying to get somebody the sack. But let's move on to another tweet that can you I sent. Answer the, can I answer that? Please point? do. So, Mr Chairman, just what I'd say is that, um, as along with a number of female politicians, I am subjected to a small number of men who do tweet about me obsessively, aggressively and pleasantly, and James O'Brien is one of them. Oh, well, I can't find those, uh, those tweets that you mentioned, but here's something that you, uh, you did retweet about, and I'll quote it. I believe James O'Brien of LBC fame is a hate preacher, a liar, a misogynist, a UK hater, UK hater, and an apologist for Islamic atrocities. You're in no position to talk about James O'Brien saying uh, offensive things about you. You tweeted that. I mean, apart from being actionable and defamatory, it's grotesque. Well, I'm glad you agree. I, I don't agree with you, and I have. You think it's appropriate? Here. I haven't come here today to answer to tweets about tweets that I sent years ago. I, I do understand, you know, the context in my role as a Secretary of State, but as I said, as a female politician, it's nothing to do with being a female politician. Do, it's nothing to. As many females do yeah. have to respond assertively to the to the uh, numerous 
aggressive, unpleasant tweets. And I would, looking at your own tweet history, wouldn't say it was something to be particularly proud of either. Oh, you'll find no, you'll find no abuse in my tweet history. Otherwise, I'm sure, otherwise I'm sure you'd have produced it uh, today. It's quite an entertaining exchange. I mean, the idea that because she's a female person in public life, she has to retweet that, you know, the kind of thing she retweeted doesn't really stack up for me. But even though it's obviously relevant to her job because she is pushing forward this online harms bill, I do have some sympathy for the idea that select committees shouldn't be about past tweets. We've all tweeted things. The problem, though, is, is that the talk did get onto more substantive policy, in particular the future of Channel 4. And on that, she was no more convincing. So I would argue that to say that just because Channel 4 has been established as a public service broadcaster and just because it's in receipt of public money, we should never kind of audit the future of Channel 4 and we should never evaluate how Channel 4 looks in the future and whether or not it's a sustainable and viable model. It's quite right that the government should do that. But, but Channel 4 is not like the BBC. Uh, it, it, it's not in receipt of licence fee money. It, no. it, it makes its money from commercial operations. And so, although it's, yeah, and the... I mean, there are a range of views. Obviously, Channel 4 has taken a particular position uh, on the future. Um, there's so can I just say that the discussions about the what we do with Channel 4 and how we evaluate Channel 4 also happened before I arrived yeah. in my post. I've yeah, no, picked no. this up, and and I feel, just so, so I was looking to Sarah to, to clarify what you just said on the, on the funding. The, the first thing she says there when she's been categorically proven wrong is, uh, yeah about that you know she's the secretary of state and she's just been told you know on, it's being filmed it's live she's just been told that she doesn't know something really significant about a really significant part of her job she thinks that channel 4 gets public funding she's told in front of all of these mps no it doesn't and uh i think we can take a look we're going to take a look at that again so although it's yeah and the i mean there are a range of views obviously that civil servant who is sitting next to her is going to get some you know, some some kudos when she gets back to the office because Nadine Doris was very much saved there. Barnaby, I want to bring you in on this. Your thoughts on either Nadine Doris sending late night trolley tweets about James O'Brien or her not knowing very much about a channel she is, you know, supposed to regulate. Well, Nadine Doris is uh, one of a kind in British politics, but she exemplifies a broader problem and she exemplifies it very clearly, which is a, an apparently strange kind of coexistence. The coexistence of a great panic about so-called cancel culture, a claim that the left has become authoritarian and repressive and is shutting down free speech, emanating from a political right, which has taken on increasingly uh, authoritarian dynamics. So the same culture secretary who complains about anonymous Twitter accounts and quite uh, nastily or, or, or bizarrely or both uses the death, the murder of a politician uh, to launch a campaign about anonymous Twitter accounts is involved in trying to push through Paul Dacre to run Ofcom uh, to heavily politicize uh, a, a crucial regulatory body in British media, trying to privatize Channel 4 because Channel 4 dissents basically because it's seen as a space slightly free from BBC impartiality regulations and the government doesn't like its dissent, while also um, uh, stifling the space for, for, for dissent at the BBC uh, and trying to use impartiality, the new director general trying to use impartiality um, uh, to stifle dissent there, uh, attacking an organisation as boring as the National Trust for daring to uh, talk about links between properties that they run and slavery. Uh, Tory MPs attacking Britain's leading, really Britain's only uh, race equality think tank, the Runnymede Trust, uh, which has come under attack from, from the government. So there's a kind of chilling of the space of dissent that seems bizarrely to coexist with a worry about cancel culture. I don't think, in fact, it is that bizarre. I think we can understand a lot of the worries about cancel culture today as a kind of backlash politics, where the left has uh, made advances in uh, struggles against racism and struggles against uh, patriarchy and misogyny, for example. Um, uh, it's not easy to respond to those advances by saying, actually, I quite like racism and I think women belong at home. But it is easy to say, oh, the problem is these militant, loud, 
out activists who've gone too far. So that the way that you defend those old systems of oppression is by focusing on the militancy of their opponents and casting them as a real threat. And this is a, a very, very traditional uh, model. Uh, but it is today uh, taken to um, uh, quite extreme lengths. We see a new uh, so-called sort of free speech university being established in the United States, uh, hiring academics who've been cancelled, uh, run by, among others, Barry Weiss, who specializes in uh, trying to harass and intimidate uh, academics who support Palestinian human rights. So this apparently strange contradiction between a politics that is very obsessed uh, with anxieties about the left cancelling people, while in fact there's a genuine cancel culture, uh, not from a few angry people on Twitter, and there have always been angry people, uh, uh, maybe social media amplifies it, uh, but, but more worryingly from the state and from uh, companies as well. And I think we should think of that not as the leftists sometimes want to do, just as a free speech issue. We should think of it as an issue of a backlash against advances that the left has made, uh, where uh, the, the repressive dynamic takes hold uh, as a way of avoiding saying what they actually want to say, uh, which is that they don't like the fact that Channel 4 dissents and that uh, there is dissent in the media and that the Runnymede Trust dares to talk about racism and the National Trust dares to talk about slavery. Thank you.